All right, gang, please have a seat. Joel, do you know what this is? Oh, yeah. It's on the ground. Please have a seat, please. Thank you, whoever whistled, Connie. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Good morning and welcome to Calvary Solid Rock. As you see, our youth worship team was leading this morning. They are actually going to be leading worship as well at an outreach this afternoon, I guess the afternoon, 5 o'clock, at Calvary Chapel St. Paul is doing their annual, 13th annual, God's Not Broke outreach. Uh, it's at their coffee shop. The name of their coffee shop is Sojourner's Cafe. You can get information about that at Calvary Chapel St. Paul's website. Uh, or else you could probably Google Sojourner's Cafe if you know how to spell Sojourner's. Um, but basically, if you take 90 foot, yeah, you know, there's some, a lot of O's and U's in it. So O's, <laughs> my Minnesota accent's coming out, O's and U's. Um, but basically, if you get on 94 heading east, get off on White Bear Avenue and go north on White Bear Avenue, I think it's about two miles. It'll be on the right-hand side. Just look for all the people, because they do block off the street. They get a street permit. They get to set up a stage. They have, there's going to be worship and music. There's going to be teaching and there's also going to be free food and there's also they do this thing called a reverse garage sale and which is what it sounds like you get to get things from the garage sale as opposed to paying for them so uh yeah just come and it's it's a it's an, an event that they use to outreach to the community and to bring be able to preach the gospel and, and bring people to christ so uh they've done it for like i said 13 years and we've uh, our fellowship in, in one form or another has participated over the last number of years as well. So uh, keep them in prayer, but please plan on coming. Uh, Jamie is actually at the farmer's market this morning. I don't know if anybody joined him. I'm not sure if he got any response, but we've got one more farmer's market outreach, the Golden Valley Farmer's Market. It's two weeks from today. So if you're interested, please talk to Jamie and uh, pl plan on being here at the church at 745. I know he needs a commitment, and I think he, all, he only needs three people to come with him. So if you're, if you're interested in doing the last outreach, and it's just a way of, again, to, we hand out free water, we hand out invitations to come to church, and if the Lord op opens up opportunity to share the gospel, that as well. So, uh, um, you know, if you're interested in that, see Jamie, or you can talk to Paul Sproviero, which I think, actually there's a group of people from our fellowship as well, uh, Paul Sproviero. Jack and Tina Culbertson and Sam Ajay are out uh, participating in the Harvest Crusade that they're doing in at Dodger Stadium. Uh, and I think it's it's a couple night stadium, right, Nanama? It's like last night and tonight as well. So pray for them as they are being used in that venue of ministry as well. So uh, one other thing, I think, uh, um, just to remind the ladies, our women's Bible study is going to be kicking off on the 18th, which is a Tuesday. It's here at church. The kickoff's here at church. It is at 7, Cindy, right? And uh, also, too, there's going to be a north and a south study and more details to come. Oh, go ahead. And the studies are available to be picked up out in the fellowship area there. So other than that, oh, I think in about two weeks, tentatively, we're planning a children's ministry meeting for the next rotation that's coming up. So if you're interested in serving children's ministry, please plan on hanging out here. We'll probably do something as far as food, either order out or maybe we'll grill again or, or something, or you could, maybe we could have a potluck. But uh, children's ministry meeting a couple weeks from now. If you have any questions about that or would like to serve, you can talk to Eric or Amy Wetter. So with that, we are in Matthew chapter 26. So please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. Connie, Connie, do you have another one of these? I might need it. You can just throw it at me and I'll catch it in my mouth. <laughs> you, 
<laughs> you do throw like a girl. And I, and, and I bend over like an old guy. Ugh. I sure hope my shirt was down far enough. <laughs> that plumber's thing going on. Um, all right. Matthew chapter 26. <clears throat> Lord, we just ask that you'd bless this time now as we study your word. Lord, that our hearts are prepared. Lord, that you'd speak to us. Lord, that you'd conform us more into the image of your son, Jesus, as we study your word. We just ask you these things in your name. Amen. In the previous two chapters, Jesus has answered the questions posed by his disciples regarding the destruction of the temple, his return, and the end of the world. You know, one thing that Luke's gospel brings up, and I'll have you turn to Luke 21 before we get to Matthew 26, but this is prompted by them being in the temple and looking at it and admiring it. <clears throat> but there's an, another element in Luke chapter 21, and I'm just going to make one real quick point with it and then bring it in, include it later on in the study. But in Luke 21, it says, right there in verse 1, it says, And he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth, I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all these of their offerings, of, um, all of these of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God. But she of her penury, or of, that's old King James, for of her desperate need, her destituteness, has cast in all that she, the living that she has. And then it says in verse 5, then some spake of the temple and how beautifully it was adorned and all this. And, and through that then, Jesus then launches into, you know, the same section in Matthew 24 and 25, where Jesus says, you're going to see all this destroyed at some point, and prompts the disciple to ask those two questions, or those three questions which we've been answering over the last couple of weeks. Jesus answers those questions in chapter 25 that he gives uh, parables uh, to kind of illustrate or to demonstrate the importance of being watchful and of waiting and occupying until his return. And so in chapter 26 opens with, and it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings. So it's speaking of chapters 24 and 25. He said unto his disciples, You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, <clears throat> and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. So in verse 2, it's now, <clears throat> and you know, you might be thinking, okay, we're, we're, we're basically in the midst of what we would call Holy Week, if you brought up in any type of tradition, church tradition, where there's the celebration of Palm Sunday, which is Jesus' entry and presentation to Jerusalem and, and allows himself to be recognized as their Messiah. And then, you know, that's kicked off with Sunday, and then on, on the Friday, Jesus will be crucified. And so when it says here that it's two days before the feast of the Passover, we're into that. We're past that point. Jesus and his disciples have come back to Jerusalem with the express purpose of Jesus going to the cross. And he's told them that. And a number of times we've seen this in our study of Matthew's gospel. In chapter 16, verse 21, I think it's the first time he introduced this to his disciples. And it says, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and to be killed and to be raised again the third day. He mentions once again in chapter 17 that the same thing is going to happen. He doesn't mention Jerusalem by name, but it's, he says that the Son of Man will be betrayed into the hands of men. And then he mentions it once again in Matthew chapter 20 and verses 18 and 19. And I say this because every time that he mentions it, the disciples don't get it. But now we're just two days away from the fulfillment of that. Jesus is telling them real clearly, in two days is the feast of the Passover, 
and he says the Son of Man is going to be betrayed and crucified. It couldn't be any clearer than that. They've talked about the destruction of the temple, things that are going to happen in the future. That took place at 70 AD. He talks about the signs of his return and of the end of the world. And again, too, those things are off. You know, we've gone now 2,000 years since Jesus has said that. But Jesus now says in two days he's going to be crucified. It's as if their focus is, is taken off the future and now it's back to reality. It's back to the present. And I, I bring that up just because then there is, Jesus has, you know, is laying out to them what the plan of God is. But contrary to that plan or in opposition to that plan, is the assembling together of the priests and of the scribes and of the elders mentioned in verse 3. And they gather into the palace of the high priest, who is Caiaphas. Now there's actually two high priests that are mentioned in the scripture, Caiaphas and Annas. I think in Luke chapter 3 it mentions them as well. Um, in our passage it doesn't mention Annas, but Annas is actually the father-in-law to Caiaphas. And so he is the elder, he is the one that when Jesus is arrested, they take him actually first to the house of Annas, the high priest. Annas was actually the high priest um, and was recognized as the high priest by the people. And the other thing that you need to know about Annas is Annas is the guy that really profited from the, the selling and the ex money exchanging that took place in the temple court area. He was the guy that was profiteering. He was the guy that when Jesus began his public ministry and at the end of his public ministry, Jesus went into the temple and saw the money changers and the buying and, and selling of goods and just the merchandising of, in a sense, all things that had to do with the worship of God. And Jesus then turned over those tables and was angry and just said that this place had been turned into a den of thieves. It should have been the, uh, a house of prayer. That's what it's called by in God's word. Annas, the father-in-law, and I think too, commentators say that Annas actually had given up that position or recognized that position of high priest because he, he needed to attend to then the, the, the money-making aspect of the temple. And his son-in-law, Caiaphas, is actually appointed by the Roman government to be high priest. And they consult, it says in verse 4, how they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. Now this isn't the first time and one thing I'll have you note is that there's, in, 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 including in their plan of killing Jesus or putting him to death, included in their plan is they, they give the one important thing that they don't want to happen. In verse 5 it says, not on the feast day lest there be an uproar among the people. They recognize how popular Jesus has become. In John chapter 11, and I'll have you turn there, in John chapter 11, you're some, you, you should be familiar with Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And, you know, John's gospel is written in a particular way that the first 11 chapters deal with, the, I believe, about the first three, three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, his public ministry. But then from chapter 12 on, it's occupied with just then that holy week beginning with Jesus coming into Jerusalem and then ending with Jesus being crucified and then on the third day rising again on what we would call Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday. But in John chapter 11 there is something that takes place. Jesus gets word of his friend Lazarus dying or that he's sick and that he's dying. And, and Mary and Martha no doubt had sent word to Jesus and yet Jesus doesn't come right away and he actually waits deliberately and when he then shows up on the scene in Bethany, Lazarus has already died. And, I, and, and you know this story, you know, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. But what the thing I want you to note is in chapter 11 then is the response of the priests, the chief priests and of the Pharisees. And in verse 47 it says that they're gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees and the council and said, what do we do? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him alone, all men will believe on him and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. So they're concerned not only uh, about themselves and their personal positions that they've achieved in whatever authority or power structure that they have in their society, but they're also concerned about the Romans coming in and just simply, um, you know, completely oppressing and wiping out the nation of Israel. 
because of Jesus. That's their concern, legitimate or not. I think they're more concerned about themselves than they are the Romans. In verse 49 it says, And one of them named Caiaphas, being high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this he spake not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also for the children of God that were scattered abroad. See, Caiaphas used, thinks, is actually planning and thinking, this is a way that we can actually bring cohesion to the, the Jewish people. When they hear that Jesus has been put to death, then it will bring the people together. And so all of it has to do with their planning. They, they want this to happen. They think it's necessary for it to happen. They're concerned for themselves. They're concerned for their positions, but they also see it as a, a way of bringing about unity in the nation. But the other thing they're concerned about is the reaction of the people that are followers of Jesus. And they're concerned about the fact that during the Feast of the Passover, one of the three major feasts that the Jewish people were required to celebrate, Josephus, the Jewish historian, records that it's estimated that the population at Jerusalem would swell to about three million people. And if, they, if, if, if the timing of this is wrong, if they do this, then they don't want the crowds or the multitudes to turn against them. So they're thinking we have to do this before the feast day. And from John's account of them actually making this planning, we don't know how much time has gone by from when the first time. Well, we know that it, it took place on the heels of the resurrection of Lazarus, but we don't know how much time has elapsed because Jesus and his disciples then um, re, you know, retreat to the wilderness for a season and they don't you know, come into Jerusalem until Jesus then is presented once again as the Messiah on, on Palm Sunday. So we don't know how much time has gone by that they've already planned once. And here in our passage in verse 3 when it says that they're assembled together, the chief priests, they're planning once again. But they're, the, the whole thing of their plan is, is we don't want it to happen on the feast day. We're afraid of how the people are going to respond. The, the feast of the Passover was a celebration that would last a week, or I believe it was eight days, but on the heels of it was also the celebration of the Sabbath. And as I think about this and read both our passage and read this passage in John chapter 11, I think about, wow, these guys are really trying to plan for every possibility and every contingency, and they're, 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 they're scheming. That's all the best way I can say it is that they've got their plans and their schemes and, and the things that they want to accomplish. And it just kind of reminds me of sometimes the strategies and the plans that take place in governments and in kingdoms and, and maybe even ourselves. You know, we try to come up with our plans and we try to scheme things. And yet God has a plan. And Jesus is going to be crucified and it is going to take place on the feast day. And it, you know, at least for those of us as believers and as we've studied God's word, we see that Jesus is the Passover. He is the, the, the Passover is just simply an illustration or an example of the coming Messiah that would die on the cross, his blood would be shed, and because of the application of his blood in our lives, the judgment of God has been passed over. Remember when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he said, he says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know, the whole point of the Passover was God delivering his people from the bondage of Egypt. And the point of the cross is the, Jesus delivering people from their sins. It's accomplished, in a sense, in the same way. They didn't want it to happen on the feast. They had their plans, but God has his plans as well. And as, as much as we try to make our own plans, and even to try to fight against the plans of God, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. And for us as believers, when we come into a relationship, I know that we love to submit our lives to God, hopefully when it comes to decisions that we make, hopefully when it comes to even making plans for our own lives, we approach that in prayer. And Lord, we, we say, Lord, you know, my life isn't my own anymore. What is, what is it that you want me to do? What are the decisions that you want me to make? 
And the scripture talks about the importance of seeking out godly counsel or godly wisdom, of seeking the heart and the mind of God, of, uh, again, to applying the truths of God's word to our lives, to, to discern what the will of God is for our lives. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9, it says, A man's heart devises his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. Even whether believer or non-believer, people make their plans, but ultimately, when it comes to what God is wanting to accomplish, God is the one that directs steps. And I love even, too, in, in John chapter 11, the commentary regarding Caiaphas's plan to put Jesus to death and that it would unify the nation, you know, uh, it says that he prophesied this, that the Holy Spirit, in a sense, you know, caused him to prophesy these things, that Jesus should die for the nation, verse 51. And Caiaphas doesn't, you know, Caiaphas doesn't have a, a, a real love for God. Caiaphas doesn't have a love for the Son of God. He's just wanting to put him to death, and yet it says that he is prophesying, and God is using him to speak this word in a prophetic sense. A man's heart devises his ways, but God directs his steps. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, it says that we're to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not into our own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. And I think too many times we as Christians, we get in so much turmoil or angst about maybe even a decision that we have to make or a circumstance that we're in. And God has never, ever left the throne. God isn't, you know, okay, in control for a while, and then all of a sudden he's taking a break from being in control of our lives. God is always in control. Even in the times that we don't feel his presence or feel that he's in control, he is in control. And he's working out his perfect will in our lives. He's working out his perfect will in this particular situation of Jesus going to the cross in two days, even though the chief priests have their plans. And You know, one thing I've found out, though, too, is, is that even when we make our own decisions, and that doesn't mean, too, that we can just simply flippantly do anything we want. Well, it's going to be all right. God's in control. You know, sometimes we suffer for the consequences of it, and hopefully we learn from those. But I feel that when we approach anything that involves making a decision or the direction for God or for for our lives you know and wanting to be pleasing to God even when we make mistakes I love then the promise of Romans chapter 8 when it says that we know that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord or love God and are the called according to his purpose Romans 8 verse 28 I, I, I end up reciting that a lot because I just constantly look at sometimes situations or circumstances or decisions I've made and then, you know, all I can do is say, Lord, redeem it and work it for good. You know, I love you, please. Lord, I love you. Please redeem it. Please work it out for good. But they've made their plans and in verse 6 then through verse 13, which is what we're just going to look at for the rest of the, the time, it says, When Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. And when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? I should probably pause there <clears throat> because as she is pouring out this precious ointment or this perfume from this alabaster box, I'm just going to say it cost a lot. And that's the, the, the point of their concern. And when you, you say, well, how much does it cost, Mike? Well, how much did you make last year? Imagine that's how much the perfume cost. And, and I'll, I'll get, get into that explanation in a little bit. But when the disciples see, and we know then too from John's account of this in chapter 12, John chapter 12, that this is Mary of Bethany. And as she is pouring this, this costly perfume or ointment upon his head, the disciples are thinking, ding, 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 wow, what are you doing? To what purpose is this waste? And it says, and this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. The disciples sound like they could be politicians because they're, they, they've got a great plan for spending someone else's money or resources. 
That's what they're thinking. It, they, you know, never mind that it belonged to Mary of Bethany. We could have taken this and sold it and, and distributed it to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she hath wrought or done a good work upon me. For you have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, where, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there, sh there shall also this that this woman has done. Um, but he, uh, <laughs> I messed it up there. And that it will be told for a memorial of her. So, getting back then to the scene. And in John chapter 12, there's more details that are given. Now, one thing I'll mention to you is, you might think, wow, you know, that particular scene where Mary of Bethany is pouring this out seems really familiar to Luke chapter 7. It does. It really does. It, even, too, down to the name of the person that's throwing the feast or the head of the house, because um, in, in John chapter... Um, or actually, in, in Matthew chapter 26, it says that all this is taking place in verse 6 in the house of a guy named Simon the leper. I'm sure that he was a leper and he's been healed of his leprosy. And in Luke chapter 7, there is this story of a Pharisee that invites Jesus to come into his house for dinner. And his name is Simon. He's a Pharisee. There's distinctions between the two stories, even though they're very similar, because it says in Luke's account in chapter 7 that this woman who was known as a sinner, she came and she, she sat at, as Jesus sat at meat, the woman came into the house and she brought an alabaster box of ointment, and she stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anoint them with the ointment. And so then, as Simon begins, Simon the Pharisee begins to think about this. He's thinking, wow, this woman's a sinner. If Jesus was really a prophet, he would know what type of woman was touching him. You know, and he's, there's an indignation inside of him as he thinks about this taking place. Because again, too, the Pharisees thought that by touching someone that was a sinner, in a sense that they were made, they were defiled, that they became defiled of their holiness or of their righteousness. But Jesus then uses the story to illustrate something. And the point is, is that this woman had been forgiven a great debt. But there's a distinction that's made because they happen at two different times in the ministry of Jesus' ministry. This happens at the end of Jesus' ministry. This happens in the middle of it. But they also happen in two different locations because it's not Bethany in Luke chapter 7 where this is taking place, which is the city that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are from. So there's some distinctions, but there are some similarities. And I love the fact that Jesus explains the motive in both of them. And in our passage then, in John, and I'd actually like to have you turn to John chapter 12 now at this point, because there's even more detail that's given. Because in our passage it mentions that this is taking place in the house of Simon the leper. And in John chapter 12, it gives us a few more details. In verse 1 it says that, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. So, the first verse is just simply stating that Jesus and his disciples, after they come into Jerusalem, each day at the end of the day, they would leave Jerusalem, and they were staying at the house, or with Lazarus and with his sisters. And in verse 2, then it says, there, was made, there they made him a, a supper, and Martha served but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. And it says, Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spike, spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of the disciples, in our passage it mentions all the disciples were indignant, but in John's account here it points out who's the spokesman. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Now, again, 300 pence might not sound like much, but remember when we were studying a few chapters back of the, the, the guy that owned the vineyard and he was hiring laborers for the day, what is it that he agreed to pay them? A pence or a penny a day. A penny was the amount that a person, would, a laborer, would work for and get paid for in a day. That was an average day's wage. So when it says 300 pence, if you account for maybe weekends or Sabbaths that you would take off, um, that's about a year's wage. That's why I said, think about in your mind how much you made last year. 
you know, was it 18,000 bucks a year, 20,000 bucks a year, 24,000, you know, 45,000, 56,000, who knows how much you made in a year. But imagine that's how much and how expensive this particular ointment or this perfume was. And Judas says it could have been sold for that much. In verse 6 it says, this he said not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had his hand in the, and, and, and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone against the day of my bearing has she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not. And so Jesus once again addresses those things. And so, uh, you know, in both Luke chapter 7 and in this account where Mary of Bethany is doing the same thing, what's being contained in this alabaster box is this precious perfume or ointment or ointment or spikenard. And I'll get to that in a second. Just I just want to first of all kind of bring up once again the, the response of the disciples that they're indignant. You know, they're they're concerned about this waste. Um, they this could have been sold and given to the poor. And I'm always somewhat convicted in my own heart when it comes to giving to God or when it comes to giving or pouring out of myself unto the Lord, how many times we will stop and we at times calculate the cost. And again, too, I'm not talking about just money now at this point. You know, what does it cost, dollars and cents? I'm talking about many times when it comes to there is a need or the Lord is tugging on our heart in a particular area that he wants us to give. And it may be of our time. The Lord wants me to give more time. Maybe the Lord is prompting me to serve in an area of ministry or prompting me to do something that's outside my comfort, but it involves time. And I know for a lot of people, you know, we live in a day and age where we have so many commitments. We're busy with our jobs. We're busy with maintaining our marriages. We're busy with raising our kids. We're busy with all the things that have to, we have to do around the house and and maintain our house. And so all, all of a sudden when a need arises, and again too, it, it may be, you know, it's a ministry need of, you know, serving the children's ministry or going, you know, outreaching or serving or doing something that involves ministry. We begin to calculate what the cost is in terms of time. Or we begin, begin to calculate the cost in terms of resources that I might have. And maybe too it's something just as simple as even the devotions that we spend every day. You know, I just don't have time to read God's word in the morning because I just need to get to work on time. I just can't give that time to the Lord. My kids are up or my husband or wife is up and I can't find a quiet place or, you know, or I just get going in the day and all of a sudden I, I, just, I, I, just seem, I just can't seem to give that time to God. And many times we, you know, part to add to it, like it says, we're calculating. We're beginning to think and estimate what the cost is. The disciples do that. And I, I, it's sad to say that many times we do that. We don't always give God the best or all of ourselves. And yet Jesus is going to go to the cross and he's going to lay down his, lives, his life to redeem all of our lives. You know, the thing that Jesus says even regarding the poor, and I, I was reading actually in my own devotions, I'm in Deuteronomy right now, and I just read this yesterday morning, and it just really spoke to my heart. Because Jesus points out, okay, we, we want to we sell that and we want to give it to the poor, and yet Jesus says the poor you're always going to have. There are times that we have to prioritize what the spiritual need is, even above sometimes what the needs are that seem to be always unending or that are always there. And Deuteronomy chapter 15 bears this out. Almost exactly what Jesus says as far as the poor always being with you. And Deuteronomy chapter 15 is a description of a, of a thing that would take place in the Jewish society. That if a person was out of, you know, they were poor or they, they had a debt that they could either borrow money and then they would have a period of time in which they could pay the money back 
but in the seventh year the debts would be forgiven. But one of the things they would do many times in paying the, the debt back is that they would serve. They would be servants, in a sense, slaves or servants. And so when that seventh year of release would come up, then all debts would be forgiven and the person would be set free of whatever service that they owed. And it's interesting because there would even in many ways be a, an estimation as to how much you could borrow depending on where you were in that seven year cycle or how much you could borrow or how much someone would be willing to lend you. And in Luke chapter, I mean, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 15 is kind of a description of this because one of the things that God is going to warn against is, is that if you have an opportunity to help the poor, don't calculate or estimate in your mind, okay, well, if I loan this money to my, my brother or my neighbor, my poor neighbor that's here, there's only one year until the year of release, and you know, he, if he doesn't pay me back in that next year, or I don't get a year's, you know, if I don't get that, my work out of him in that one year, then I'm going to be out all that money, and God's basically saying, don't even think that way. And, he, and this is what it says in Deuteronomy 15. If there be any among you, a poor man, of one of your brethren within any of thy gates in thy land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend unto him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Beware, this is the warning, beware that there be not a thought in your wicked heart saying, the seventh year, the year of release is at hand and thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and, thy, and thou givest him not, and you don't give him anything, and he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Thou shalt surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all that thou puttest thine hand forth. Notice what God is saying. is. God wants you to help the poor because when you help the poor, God is then going to bless you for doing that. And it says in verse 11, for the poor shall never cease out of the land. God just simply saying, you're always going to have the poor. And I think the point is, or the reason that God makes here in Deuteronomy chapter 15 is, is it's an opportunity for you to trust the Lord and for you to be used by God, but it's also God is going to use the poor then for him to bless you when you help them. And he says, therefore I command you, say, thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to the poor and to the needy in the land. So Jesus says to his disciples, you want to help the poor, you can always help them. It's not limited to, to taking the money from this woman's you know, extravagant pouring out and this blessing on the Lord. You, know, you want to help the poor, you can, you, there's always an opportunity to help the poor. That's a lame excuse for, for wanting to take this. But the other thing I love about this is that Jesus explains the reason why. Just as he did in Luke chapter 7 regarding the, the woman that had done the same thing. He explains the reason why. He said that the reason why was in verse 47 of Luke 7. He says, I say unto you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. That was the reason. Here Jesus explains the reason in verse 12 when he says, in that she has poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. See, there is a reason why Mary of Bethany is pouring out this expense because Jesus has been telling his disciples that he's going to go to Jerusalem and he's going to be crucified. And whether they lacked the discernment or they didn't want to really believe that that would take place. And remember Peter even said, you know, not so, Lord. You know, that'll never happen to you. You're just way too popular. You're too powerful. We've seen you walk on water. We've seen you stop the storms. We've seen you raise the dead. We've seen you cure the sick. You've given sight to the blind. How could they possibly put you to death? How could that ever happen? But I think Mary of Bethany has discernment and, recognize, and God is using her in a way that Jesus even says that wherever the gospel is preached, the, what she has done is going to be told for a memorial of her. We're fulfilling what Jesus has said would take place. He tells the reason why. And then getting back then to the alabaster box that she brings. Alabaster was a, a type of stone that was quarried 
near an Egyptian city called Alabastra. And as a result, then the stone that would be used was called alabaster. It's a, a very beautiful and expensive stone. And to have a box that would be used for that, you know, used for any purpose, would be an expensive container. The Jewish practice was, and especially, uh, not, you know, this would be especially the case among those that weren't that were the common people. They weren't the wealthy people because the wealthy people could afford expensive things. But one of the things that was really important as a part of the culture is that when a person was died, that they were, their bodies were pro properly prepared for burial. And part of that preparation process was the anointing of that body. The body would be washed, it would be anointed, and the, the cloths that would be used to wrap the body, and then the limbs, and then the a separate head covering would be covered with this perfume or special fragrant oil. And in a sense, it was something that was important in preparation. What the common people would do with, you know, is that they would many times, all of their lifetime, because I already mentioned the expense of this. You know, if you've ever had a loved one that's passed away and have had to pay the funeral expenses, funerals can be quite expensive. And this was part of the expense of, in a sense, of a funeral. But because the common people didn't have that kind of money, someone, you know, you know, I died and, you know, my family's not going to have that kind of money to be able to bury me. They, they would plan ahead and they would have a, a, a box, some type of a container, in which then it may be for your, the celebration of your birthday or the celebration of an anniversary or a new year, but small amounts then of spikenard or of these oils or these ointments, these perfumes that were very expensive, would be given many times as a gift or received as a gift. And all of their lives they would save. You know, it might be just a little bit that they get for a birthday or an anniversary. And from the time that maybe Mary of Bethany was a little girl, she's saving all this. And it's clear from Luke chapter 7, she's not the only one that, that in a sense saved. It was just something that was part of a practice of culture. And then when she would die, then her family would use then what she had saved up to basically anoint and prepare her body. And she has it in this alabaster box. And even though the alabaster, even saying alabaster, and I'm trying to think of which song it was. I don't know if it was the Battle Hymn of the Republic where it talks about cities made out of alabaster. You know, even though saying that word alabaster sounds like really expensive and costly. The real expense was what was in the box. And in John chapter 11, you know, one thing I'll bring out from the passage in John chapter 11 where we saw the plotting and the planning of the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests. But in John chapter 11, the first, or in the middle of the chapter, when Lazarus dies and Jesus shows up and Martha is grieved over the fact that if Jesus had been there, she says, my brother wouldn't have died. And Mary basically says the same thing when she shows up as well. If my brother had been here, he wouldn't have died. And the, the fact that I bring up is, is that what's, one of the things is that, that's shown here about Mary and Martha is they had a, a great trust in what Jesus, they believe, could have done. Jesus talks and teaches Martha about the resurrection in the process. But the thing that it kind of speaks to me is that, you know, it, it demonstrates how greatly Mary loved her brother. And... She could have, because of her great love for her brother, used that, you know, ointment in, in the preparation of her own brother's body that she loved, but she doesn't. And as I mentioned, the, the, the value or the cost of the box is nothing in comparison to what contains that you know, the ointment or the perfume that was in there. But it's w when it's Jesus then, and as she is being used of God in a sense to demonstrate that he's going to go to the cross and that she's preparing his body. One of the things I'll say is, is that Martha loved, I mean, Mary loved her brother. But why didn't she use the ointment on her brother? I think there's a difference. You know, she loved her brother and no doubt she loved him greatly. But the difference between what Jesus, what she does for Jesus in pouring it out is that even though 
Mary loved her brother, Lazarus. She didn't worship her brother. And the difference is, is that every time you see Mary of Bethany in the scripture, where do you see her? You see her at the feet of Jesus. She's always at the feet of Jesus. That one time where, where Jesus is in the house of Mary and Martha and she is sitting at the feet of Jesus and Martha's in the kitchen clanging pots and preparing the meal and she's even upset over the fact that Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. Same thing too when Jesus shows up in John chapter 11 at the death of her brother. She is grieved and weeping and she casts herself at the feet of Jesus. And here then in John chapter 12, as there's this supper that's made in his honor, and it's literally two days before he's to go to the cross, she is at the feet of Jesus once again. And the thing that she demonstrates is that she is a person that not only loved Jesus, but she worshipped him. She was willing to give something to him and it didn't matter what the expense was and 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 that's why i brought up the beginning of luke chapter 21 of the widow that cast in her two mites because she has something in common they both have something in common and and actually the widow with two mites and the temple it, that kind of set in motion jesus discussion for all these things of you know his return of the destruction of the temple and also too of the end of the world and now in a sense like bookends to that, you know, with the woman who's willing to give just two mites, which might not seem like much, but it was everything that she had, to Mary who poured out this ointment unto Jesus, which was, again, to, you know, put a number on it for yourself in your own mind. I mean, for me, I, the number I come up with is around 60,000 bucks or whatever. She's willing to just simply pour it out. And it's not the expense of the container, even though the container is something that's valuable. It's what goes into the container and it's, what it's what's poured out without reservation, without calculation, without estimation. It's just poured out because not only does she love Jesus, she worships him. She is worshiping him in this single act of extravagance. And I just think, you know, and I, I'm just convicted in my own heart, how many opportunities that God gives us to worship him and not just in the act of giving and of tithing you know the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver I love the fact too that even in our own fellowship uh, I never bring up tithing or giving because I'm, I want people first of all that are just believers to give because I don't think that the non-believers should give I mean I don't care if they give but I don't think they should I don't think they should be pressured my wife and I, years ago, when we still lived in Southern California, we came here to Minnesota to visit one time for church. And I remember one time going to this particular church in Minneapolis, and they had in their bulletin what the church budget was. And they broke it down per week, how much their operating expenses were. And you know what? I understand it. As a believer, I get it. Yes, it costs money to, to rent or lease a facility. Yes, it costs money to have the electricity on. It costs money to heat the place in the winter. It costs money to air condition it in the summer. It costs money for the water. It costs money for any outreach or evangelism you might do. It, might, it costs money to pay the pastor his salary. I know all those things. I understand that. But in this particular bulletin, and many churches do this, they put what the annual budget is, they break it down per week, they'll put how much was given last week. And many times, because it's less than what the weekly estimation is, then they'll say, okay, now we need this much plus the, what we were behind. And I'm thinking, and people then are made to feel guilty, and they're pressured, and they're prodded, and they're guilted, and their arms are twisted into giving. And I love the fact that God's word says he loves a cheerful giver. And I don't want people to feel like they give that way. That's, that's why a lot of times people come to our church and, and sometimes after a while they'll just say, well, don't you guys take an offering? No, you know, we don't. We have offering boxes and people can drop their tithes and their offerings in them, but there's no particular point in the service where all of a sudden I'm going to tell you what, you know, and I've been to churches like that. They just, and it's like, But that's not what Mary's like. I mean, Mary just simply gives everything. 
And giving is an act of worship. Serving is an act of worship. It's not just the songs we sing because we, we have worship before you know, the teaching of God's word takes place. But worship is something that demonstrates devotion and commitment. And it's the greatest expression of love that can be shown or given. And even though the disciples are thinking, we could have sold this and given it to the poor, a person like Mary of Bethany is thinking, this is all I have to give. I wish I could give more. This is all I've got. It's just something I've been saving all my life. And in a sense, it's useless because it just simply sits in this box. But it's, it isn't until it's poured out and the fragrance of that permeates the room. I love what God's word mentions concerning us being a fragrance unto the Lord. And if I can find it, I will. 2 Corinthians, well, there's a couple passages, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, Actually, let's go with chapter 2, verse 14 first. It says, Paul writes, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the savor, the perfume of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other we are the savor of the fragrance of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? See, your life gives off a fragrance. And when it's something that is pleasing to God, and again, too, the cost. Well, Jesus paid the price, the expensive price for our lives in going to the cross. Jesus would even ask the question, you know, what would a man give in exchange for a soul? Or what's a life worth to a person who's ever faced death? And if they had anything that they could give to save their lives, if they're looking at strictly from an earthly or carnal perspective, they, I'd give anything to save my life. I'd give anything to save my husband or my wife's life. I'd give anything to save my child's life. I mean, that demonstrates how valuable a life is. But Jesus, what would you give in exchange for a soul? You can't give anything. We can't. We, have not, we, don't have the, we don't have that kind of resources, but Jesus does. And what he gave was his life to take our place on the cross and to pay the price for our sins so that we wouldn't have to burn in hell. He gave everything to redeem us, and that demonstrates not how valuable we are, but how valuable we've become, how much God loves us. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where it talks about this, Paul says, and actually turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I'll kind of lead into it by reading verse 5. He says, We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Verse 6, for God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure, this treasure of Jesus. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. It's speaking of us, our bodies. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We've become those alabaster boxes. We've become those containers in which the most precious thing is in, and that's Jesus Christ in our lives. And when we're poured out, then we're a sweet fragrance to those that in a sense see and sense and smell and discern what our lives are. We're either, you know, to the, to the believer or to those that are, are, are responding to that, we're a sweet fragrance of, of life, you know, uh, of salvation. But to those that refuse, it's actually the smell of death. You know, even to smell probably those, those fragrances or those perfumes or those oils that were used, yeah, they were used to mask to cover the smell of death. And maybe a person smelling that might think, oh gosh, that's the smell of death. But another person looks at it, it's a matter of their perspective. It's like, no, 
It's a sweet and a beautiful fragrance regardless of the fact that there's death involved. Mary of Bethany pouring out everything that she has in preparation. And Jesus says, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what she has done will be told for a memorial. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We love you. Help us to be more like Mary, Lord. Help us to be willing to give anything that we have to serve you or bring glory, Lord, to you. Lord, that the attention wouldn't even be on us, even in, in Matthew's account as Mary's not even mentioned by name. And yet what she has done is mentioned, and Lord, it impacts us even today. Lord, help us just give of our time, of our, of our treasure, to give, Lord, of the things that we value the most, and we, we don't want to surrender, Lord, to you. Help us, Lord, to just simply pour those things out to you as an offering, because you're worthy. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for redeeming us. And it's in your name, Lord Jesus, that we pray. Amen. God bless you. If you have any questions or need some prayer, you can see me afterwards or you could talk to Jesse or talk to Aaron. I mean, Eric, who's with the children. So you are free. Don't forget about God's Not Broke. And also, too, on Wednesday.